Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Chris Brown. And today I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. He is the current city councillor for the city of Penticton, British Columbia, and he is also the managing editor for the Penticton Herald. I am pleased and honored to welcome to the show Penticton City Councillor James Miller. Councillor Miller, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, Councillor Miller, I want to start off with the very first question I've asked every single politician on my show, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Most likely my mother. Uh, she was a school board trustee for four years, and uh, that was pretty exciting because uh, I was her unofficial campaign manager as, uh, as a 13-year-old, and uh, she would take me up to the... Um, to the city hall and uh um she was uh first runner up the first time uh, they elected nine and then the second time uh, she caught the polls and uh it just really got me interested in civics uh i always knew that i was going to be some kind of newspaper writer and i always followed civics quite closely but if i owe it to anybody i guess it'd be my mom was politics discussed at the dinner table? Because a lot of people who get oh, the absolutely, it was great <laughs> because um, my mother at the time was uh, was conservative. Uh, although in later life, uh, once Mike Harris got elected in Ontario, she switched to uh, either federal liberal or NDP. Um, Dad, while Mom was a conservative, was very much a liberal, so they would uh, have. Um, some very interesting discussions and dad liked to somewhat play the contrarian, but it was great because you kind of heard both views and it was always entertaining. And you, you get involved in politics at a later date in life because you, you're originally from Ontario, you moved to Alberta, and then you are now residing in the wonderful city of Penticton, British Columbia. Absolutely. And when you moved to uh, British Columbia, was that on your mind to decide, okay, this is the time, if not now, when? So let's just throw my hat in the ring. Because in 2019, you put your hat in the ring for the very first time in a by-election. Okay, it was actually 2021. But yes, it was a by-election. Then the, uh, what, this, the, like, the information on the city of Penticton's website is wrong. Oh, sorry. It was 2021. So, okay. uh, but yes, I was elected in a by-election. Uh, this is my 15th year in, in uh, the Okanagan and it's been great. Uh, no, this was kind of something I figured I was going to do in retirement. Uh, and the word retirement really isn't in my vocabulary. Um, I want to stick with, with uh, newspapers as long as they want to stick with me and that they're still with us, hopefully. And uh, 2021, I guess, was uh, a complete accident almost. There was a by-election, sadly, um, a former mayor, and uh, he came out of retirement and ran for council. He topped the polls. His name was Jay Kimberly, a three-term mayor. It spread out at different times. And sadly, he, uh, Jake had a stroke and wasn't able to finish. I spoke to my bosses and I thought it was going to be completely stymied because again, I thought this would be something that I'd like to do in retirement, but I presented it as it was 15 months. And in all honesty, uh, Chris, I didn't think my stamina would be good enough to have a full-time job plus do that. But I thought, well, 15 months, you can go like hell and anyone can do, do anything for 15 months. And I found that it was fine because I've always been good at time management and so, yeah, we did really well in, in our first run, and I thought, so why I, not? Uh, I was able to. I was able to juggle both balls in the air, and so uh, I gave it a a run again in uh, 2022. And uh, the voters were very generous and returned me. So as as I as I usually say, this thing is recorded live. So I I was incorrect. The website no, does okay. say the 2021. It says June 19th was the election, the by election yes, day in 2021. So that's where I was confused. So I do apologize for that. No, it's all good. But I want to go back to that idea of running because journalists are weird. I was a journalist. I ran provincially. I, I ran, I ran uh, municipally, I should say up in, in Ontario. I ran municipally in uh, uh, Faust, Alberta, and it's a unique entity journalists getting into the political field. 
when you decided you were going to put your name forward while you had to talk to your the owners of the newspaper mm -hmm. that you worked for you also had to look at yourself didn't you and say okay are people gonna not talk to me because i'm the newspaper reporter and also or the editor but also the counselor as well absolutely and my opponents there were kind of us running and you know some of their supporters use that as a criticism and it's a fair criticism uh, there's no question I think it depends on the individual. I am one of two that we know of working journalists in British Columbia. Um, the other is the mayor of Ashcroft. And she also, uh, Barbara Roden is her name. And she is also the editor in a single employee newsroom, I guess, uh, their little weekly paper. And Ashcroft, of course, was in the national news about a year ago due to the devastating floods and fires and natural disasters that happened. And I spoke to her right after I got elected. It's a small world. Her mom and dad live here in Penticton. And she gave me just like awesome advice. Um, there are five steps that uh, are recommended if people absolutely insist on doing it. I did all of them, such as take the leave of absence. Uh, I played it straight. I told everybody what we do. Uh, what our plan is, that sort of thing. But she said, when you phone somebody, indicate immediately, hi, this is James Miller, and I'm calling in my role as editor of the Penticton Herald. Hi, I'm James Miller. I'm calling in my role as city councilor. And that was probably the best advice anybody's given me because we set that right away. Anything to do with city council, uh, police action, we get a heads up quite often before, before the media does. I uh, immediately recuse myself from, and it, it's worked well. Our subscribers have been great about it. Uh, it does handcuff me a lot because I would love to cover the council that I'm on if, <laughs> if, if I wasn't on it, because I would really find that. And I, I really miss covering the municipal election because that's my probably next to a rock concert of a band I like. That's my absolute favorite thing to cover. And I miss out on that. And I write a weekly column and it, it's tough because it was like that guy that wrote a book that didn't call Gatsby that didn't include the letter E anywhere. And he took the E off his typewriter. So to, um, I make absolutely zero reference even in passing to, to being on council. Uh, we had a long, a 14 term counselor. She uh, didn't seek re-election you know ordinarily I would have liked to have offered some form of tribute to her but again I've I've made that vow that um, as CBC said I'm Clark Kent uh, Batman or pardon me <laughs> Bruce Wayne Batman and so that that's been what the challenge is so I want to go back to that first uh, by-election in 2021 on June 19th um, putting your name forward is a unique entity in itself because you're mm -hmm. putting yourself out there as a reporter, you know, you're putting yourself out there, but you get to go home afterwards and you're not going door to door asking people to vote for you. You just going to meetings, going to events, and then you're asking people to come talk to you. So in your role as a reporter compared to role as a candidate, was there a big culture shock for you because you're now not asking people to give you information you're basically asking people to listen to you as you give them information about how you want to run the city or your views on the city well 2021 was a strange year if you recall because uh it was still covid and we had three meetings uh they were all on zoom and so there wasn't a public meeting. Uh, our farmer's market was open, but again, I still think people kind of frown. So I knocked on a grand total of 88 doors. And you're going to say, which 88 doors were those? Um, they were, I live in a, a small strata subdivision. And so I would have my It's Miller Time mask on and I would knock on the door and then I'd jump like 15 feet back and um, kind of wave. And the reason I specifically picked those 88 doors was I, I told them, look, I know some people consider door knocking invasive, invasive, but I didn't want my neighbors to think that I was just taking them for granted. I think it was very important to go out and just say, hey, I'm running, please remember me. And I think that was appreciated. In terms of, I guess, selling myself, I, I'm gonna be honest, I had a huge advantage because of, uh, because of media name recognition. If I look at the city of Kelowna, uh, their previous mayor, um, he got to start CHBC Global Okanagan. Um, 
the present council, Mohini Singh was CHBC. Uh, Rick Weber, who just got announced, he was the retired uh, anchor man for CHBC. He finished fourth. They elected eight. Uh, Maxine DeHart writes a uh, weekly column in their Black Press publication. Although she's not a staff member, she's a stringer. Uh, Charlie Hodge uh, is a counselor. Again, he's a retired uh, a black press uh, writer. So we do have that advantage right out of the bat. And so it was a little bit different because again, uh, by elections, winner take all. And I felt a little uncomfortable, I guess, asking for that support. I'm not great at, at that kind of thing, but uh, in all that... honesty, it was essentially what I thought it was going to be like, just because I've seen so much of this over the years. And as I say, dating back to even when my mother was a candidate, Many people get involved because of a certain issue, whether it be, hey, I want my street filled or I want X, Y, and Z done. I want a new pool in my area. I want my sidewalk paved. Was there a burning issue for yourself or was it more of you just want to give back to your community in a different way than uh, being the, the editor of the newspaper? Okay, in a two-part answer to your question, uh, what I offered to the public and even my critics couldn't really disagree with it and that was, I've paid attention. I was never the city hall reporter of the Herald. However, I did vacation relief. And for a long time, uh, my reporter had seven or eight weeks holidays. And what else we would do is due to deadlines, we would split the meeting. And in those days, it was six till 10 at night. So I would go from six till seven and whatever the first item on the agenda was, I would cover, I'd race back and, and file it and then he would finish the meeting and then of course i would editorialize on it so i i really think that not only was i familiar with penticton city council also areas uh summerland which is in our readership area all over sioux cologne i worked at the daily courier for for a stint prior to covid so i've seen what other places have done well and have done right so I think that's, I could jump in for 15 months and, and do it. I didn't need a crash course. My training was 45 minutes and they said, what do you want to know? And I, I said, what goes on in an in-camera meeting? Cause I've never been to one because <laughs> obviously they're in camera. Yeah. As for an issue, there was a very public, uh, for lack of a better word, fight with, with BC housing and the provincial government over the location of a temporary homeless shelter and council was united on that that they were taking a, a firm approach and so I did run stating that I, I would back the present council on that and because I think on an issue that was that strong I think a seven to zero vote is a lot more powerful than six to one. Yeah. Now it turns out that the provincial government essentially did what they wanted, but I felt that the mayor and the councillors of the time uh, deserved uh, a united front. That wasn't my motivation of running, but it was just the absolute perfect timing for me. Again, I could try that 15 month test run. I want, I want to talk about election night. Because election night is a Great. unique beats in itself because I've covered many municipal elections in my time. Mm -hmm. And like you said, they are my and, Super Bowl. <laughs> and, and, you know, I miss I miss the old I'm sorry, I realize I cut you off. I miss the old days where uh, before the electronic voting machines and, you know, one poll would come in and then you'd see a pattern throughout the night. And then every once in a while, I remember I was up till four in the morning once because uh the last spot on the school board was within three votes or whatever, but I, I really enjoyed those days because they were certainly dramatic, but yeah, elections are the Super Bowl. Actually, I should ask this question before I ask this, that, that, the next, yeah. that question is, how was it voting for yourself? I always find that fascinating to hear how did people find voting for themselves, <laughs> walking in and putting an X or hitting a dot and voting for <laughs> yourself and knowing you have at least got one vote. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of yeah, it's kind of a neat thing. Uh, my wife found it more uh, kind of cool, I think, that uh, you know she's she's uh, looking down the ballot and uh, finding Miller, and then you kind of think for a second, uh, I, I hope I absolutely got the right X in the box, and that, you know I don't have blurry double vision or, uh, but yeah, it was it was really cool.
And on election night, because the votes are coming in, uh, your electronic voting, what was that moment like for you when the the moment it came out that you are officially the councillor elect for the city of Penticton? Well, in the by-election, again, they discouraged us from coming. I did send a scrutineer. So we were just watching it on, on Zoom and they had said, you know, James Miller had won. And uh, we were pretty confident that we were going to win. And indeed we did. And then uh, uh, this time around, uh, you know, on October 15th, we were able to go to the, um, and that was really good. But this was, uh, Chris, weird. And this is the first time I guess I've said this publicly, but uh, I spoke to uh, Stephen Fuhrer, who was a one-term liberal MP for Kelowna Lake Country. And uh, he wasn't reelected. And he said to me after the election, as disappointed as he was that he lost, but he was actually even more disappointed that Ralph Goodale had lost in Saskatchewan, who was a cabinet minister, because he described Ralph as just a decent, competent, hardworking, all-around exceptional person. And that kind of stuck with me. So on election, I, you know, I was very happy. We were, it was the top incumbent. And I finished uh, second overall, which uh, we, were, we were really thrilled with. But it was tough because um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, well, three of them, I guess, weren't reelected. But one I was uh, close isn't the right word, but uh, I, I really respected and admired. And as happy as I was to get elected, I thought, gee, who is, you know? And, you know, the voters never wrong and that's democracy. We all believe in democracy, but it was, uh, you know, we weren't popping champagne corks and tipping over automobiles and celebration or whatever. We were, um, you know, our team was a little bummed out. Uh, I did run independently, so it wasn't a slate or anything of that nature, but I, I was sad to see. Um, Sorry, just uh, just to confirm here, Penticton doesn't have party systems like Surrey no, and Vancouver. No, no not okay. at all. Not okay. at all. Just wanted to confirm uh, it's, on that. It's never worked. Uh, so, yeah, it was, so that's that's an interesting night. Like, uh, was it exciting? Well, yeah, we were we were really pleased, but uh, again, a little disappointed because uh, you know everybody can't win, and uh, but I, I, I certainly I certainly feel for them. My last question in this segment before we turn to the issues that are facing your city is this. Um, Walking into council chambers as a reporter is different than walking in as a counselor. That oh, very yeah. first meeting, walking in and you're about to be sworn in. Did you put a weight and responsibility on yourself? Because the decisions you now make in that chamber, the votes you make are going to affect your neighbors, your family, your tax dollars, people's lives. How much of a weight, and do you still carry that weight with you as you go through day-to-day -day votes or weekly votes in your council meetings? Uh, I think so, and I I do my homework, and I read the agenda package uh, at least one and a half times, and you know, try and go in with uh, with an open mind and a clear conscience. Uh, but I'm never nervous. I've you know, uh, do the best that I can. And I realize that uh, the the public uh, put me there and I'll be as uh, well prepared as I can for them. Do you, were you shocked at the amount of conversation people might have with you at the, at the corner store or at the grocery store or at the gas station about issues that are in front of uh, council? Or were you prepared for uh, that because of your background in the, the media? Uh, no, I wasn't because again, it's, I guess in the segment, I'll, I'll jump back I, again. I started with, with COVID and we were still, gosh, about eight, eight months before the end of it, there were kind of soft openings, so to say. So I didn't, and I love going out to public events. I, I probably leave the council for that now that they've opened up. So I didn't have as much face-to-face -face action. People say, well, what, what's been the biggest surprise? And that is, um, I find that people are satisfied telling you off on a Facebook site or a chat room or even via uh, an email, but they rarely, and maybe it's because I'm tall or male, I don't know, but rarely, and it's yet to happen, um, have people really been confrontational in public or raised their voice in public? And I really found that there was an opening 
in COVID rules briefly, and they're able to have a, an all day concert of tribute bands up at, uh, up at our park. And I was there on and off for about five hours. And we just had a really unfortunate situation where we didn't vote at the time to extend the number of police officers. And then there was a very bad assault that happened in the community that certainly upset a lot of people. And this is two days before this event. And so I'm going uh, to the event and I thought for sure that somebody would throw a mini donuts at me or or heckle me when I was on stage or or yell at me or or even pull me aside and say hey look I'm really disappointed at how you handled that and that doesn't happen and maybe that's because people overall are great but I, I I think in the internet culture and I'm biased because I'm a print guy traditional media guy I think once they get that out of their system online that uh, it's satisfied them and so that I don't think there's as much face-to-face -face confrontation as there may have been 10 15 20 years ago you mentioned social media and I wasn't going to talk about this but you opened it up so you, I want to play mm -hmm. in Pandora's box here for a few seconds if you're okay with that um sure Social media, especially at a municipal level, has become more toxic over the last few years that I've seen. I used mm -hmm. to be in municipal politics. I, I worked as a communications coordinator for a town, and I know it is horrible. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with the negativity? Like, Because if I'm a tourist, which we're going to talk about tourism here in a few minutes, but if I'm a tourist going to a city, I'm looking at the rants and raves discussion boards. I'm looking at the the city's Facebook page and saying, is it a welcoming city? Is it something I want to go to? And social media can be that sort of first glance that some people see and they may just overlook. I'm not saying Penticton's this way. I'm just saying, how do you as a counselor fight back against that social media negativity? Do you just ignore it and hope it goes away? Or is there another option that you have done? Well, in fairness, I think social media has its place. Uh, to uh, Penticton, the swaps go around, we elected three people in their 30s, which uh, is, is positive for the youth vote for sure. And I think they all had a very strong social media presence. One candidate who, who ran unsuccessfully actually is the founder of Penticton's largest Facebook page. And so he certainly had a, a huge following on there. In terms of how do I handle it, I think it's important not to answer because I think, I don't think anybody's ever won an argument on Facebook. And or so <laughs> I think it's important to get the, I think it's important <laughs> to get the mood of the community. And I think it's important to read that, but I think a mistake that some, candidates or certainly elected officials if you're if you're starting to get into a back and forth and that sort of thing i don't do uh what i may say is uh please uh, give me a call i would love to discuss this with you and maybe one in five times somebody will take you up on it what frustrates me and again i'm a as i said i'm a newspaper guy but i you know i grew up with uh you know traditional radio which i miss terribly uh television uh, advertising at the bowling alley where on your scorecard before when electronic they have little squares around uh, with barber shops and things like that but what frustrates me is some, some of the things that are said on social media if I published it uh, at the very least somebody would be getting a front page apology and on, on social media they don't seem to be held accountable and some of the things they're saying are I wouldn't know libelous not towards necessarily elected officials but anybody and the worst thing that might happen is they'll lose their their status in this certain group. And that's very, very frustrating. So I want to turn to the city now because, uh, and I, before I start this segment, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between myself and the counselor. This is not a decision at council. This is not a motion sure. at council. This is just his opinion and his belief. So it could be a little bit different Correct. from what council is, but it's just one counselor talking to a host right now. That's right. And I do, I do not speak on behalf of Penticton City Council. Exactly. I've gotten very negative emails from some people saying that okay. from past interviews. So I want to ask the opening question and it's a very over, uh, it's a very open-ended question. In your opinion, counselor, what are the big issues facing your city right now? 
Okay, that's a really easy question. <laughs> okay, never I mind. would say it has. Uh, I I would say it has hy- uh, hyphens in this, and that would definitely be people experiencing homelessness dash opioid dash crime. Number one. So how do we deal with it? How do you, as a counselor, advance this issue? Because you're not the first person to tell me that. I can tell you that right now. And homelessness, crime, while it is a municipal uh, issue that you're facing, justice, houselessness is all a provincial issue. So you're getting downloaded onto some of these issues. So how do you deal with it? How do you try to advance this? Well, uh, one thing that I fought really hard about, and this was back in the by-election, and, and I was actually very vocal about it even before I even knew there was going to be a by-election, and we had uh, an addictions resource center um, called Pathways and uh, Interior Health, which is our health authority, which goes from the issues Washington border up as far as Kamloops, Kelowna, right in the middle of it. Uh, they canceled their contract with them. Um, I tried my hardest. Uh, I got counsel to support a, a notice of motion to to write to the provincial government and interior health, and it fell on deaf ears. They felt that they were doing it well enough with their uh, existing nurses and system that they have, which I highly beg to differ. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about that because people outside of Penticton, that probably won't mean much. Uh, our mayor did meet with the head of interior health which is unusual because she usually dodges any kind of uh political request to even zoom into a meeting and that was very good from what i know i wasn't uh at the meeting uh but he believes very much in what's called the car 40 program and that's where a nurse uh travels around with the police uh at night and then they're more qualified not, no disrespect to our police to to handle a mental health or addictions issue uh we requested that for penticton amazingly we didn't receive it but the funding went to Kamloops and Kelowna uh, our mayor does want to examine that as something that we'll pay for as a made in penticton solution uh right now it's in the discussion phases uh I tend to agree with you that that's a downloading of services, that health, like when did mental health stop being a health issue? And that's provincial. However, uh, pointing fingers and say, you have to do this, or you did this wrong, or you did this wrong, nothing gets achieved. So I think that's a possibility, but it is a tough, tough problem. And here's passing the buck 101, but I wish... And I say this with all due respect, I wish the Prime Minister Trudeau, or if Mr. Polyev is the next Prime Minister, or Mr. Singh, whomever, will declare a national state of emergency, because this is challenging. This is bigger than the city of Vancouver. It's bigger than the city of Calgary. It's certainly bigger than Vernon and Penticton. And we need a plan, and we need we need help, we need guidance. And even if the plan is not a very good plan, at least it's something to work with because I believe that we have a national crisis that isn't limited to the Okanagan Valley and we do, we do need assistance. So I I have to ask this question because your residents of your city don't care if it's a federal issue, a provincial issue or a municipal issue, they want you to fix it and they'll come to you probably, or email you with federal provincial or municipal issues. How do you balance that? Because you can't just say, no, I'm going to point my finger and go talk to your MP or your MLA. You have to say, okay, how can I help you deal with this? Well, that's the toughest question because, while doing some campaigning or, or going out, uh, a uh, older gentleman, uh, maybe my dad's age, and he's a get rid of the street people. And to which I said, how? Well, again, it didn't matter to him. It was just get it done. And I think why this is so absolutely confusing and such a such a tough issue is that Uh, nearby Oliver, which is about uh, 40 kilometers from here, they had a problem with agricultural land flooding. Their siphon was broken. So they replaced the siphon, $12 million. Uh, They're going to pay it over 25 years. They were hoping that the feds would kick in. They didn't. But guess what? 
no more flooding. <laughs> and that's what's sad is that we could commit an astronomical amount of money and, and say, okay, look, your taxes are going to take a hit this year, but we're going to solve this problem. And it's, it's something that isn't going to happen overnight. And I don't think um, any sum of dollars will necessarily solve it. But I also think societally, we have to show love and compassion as well uh, into uh, what's a, a very challenging situation. Uh, some people are blaming the court system. And again, I think that's passing the buck because I don't think they've ever been in the court system or unless it's to get divorced because you know they have the judges have to follow the criminal code of canada and there's uh precedent setting cases um uh the person's history that sort of thing so to blame the judges and and the crowns uh, i think is unfair as well but it's always again, the, it's uh, always uh, easier Mr. To... Trudeau, if you're watching like, please <laughs> help us we need we need guidance um We've talked about what you believe is the issues that is facing your city. We've talked about downloading and residents. I want to continue on the residents path here for a second, because if I go talk to a hundred people in your city, they will all tell me something different about the issues that they believe are facing their city, whether it be a pothole, whether it be a sidewalk, whether it be a high taxes, I don't care. I've heard them all. I, you, uh, your city is probably no different. How do you juggle the different opinions that are you face every day? Because you're one person, you're there representing the city, and you have to best represent and best decide what money goes where when it comes to fixing infrastructure, changing or uh, increasing pool fees. How do you balance the needs of you against the needs of the entire city? Well, I am going to disagree with you, Chris. I think probably... Really? 90% or more of the people would say crime, homeless, opioid crisis. I, I think they would be in agreement of that as the number one. You were the first counselor to push what, back on me. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Well, which I would say now we can get into what's number two, three, four, five, if you want to yeah. ask that. But your question Again, I'm sorry, is how do I... How do you I balance? Because Mary, Mary Jane on Road X is going to say that I need my pothole fix. This is the biggest issue sure. that's facing me right now because my car gets hit every day. If you go talk to Tom on road Y, he's going to say, no, my sidewalk needs to be uh, paved because my kids go back and forth to school on it and it needs to get done. How do you balance and how do you pick the winners and losers at the end of the day? Because not everyone is going to get everything they want because well, for not, sure. there's no money for everyone. Well, I think if you're willing to listen to people and I always do forward uh, concerns on, so I think that's important. And I don't think anybody's necessarily wrong. We have public hearings and some guy's going to put a carriage house onto his property and it's uh, three meters too wide and people are annoyed because it's going to create parking. I, no matter how I vote, I think rarely is the public wrong. They may have a different viewpoint. And by that, I say, if I, if I say Toronto is the capital of Canada, well, that's wrong. Ottawa. If I say Trump won the 2020 election, well, that's wrong. We all know. Whoa, that whoa, whoa, wrong, whoa, 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 whoa. You you're trying to get me canceled yeah. here, counselor? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> but I think when somebody says, you know, they're concerned about parking uh, with this carriage house and what it will do, <sighs> some elected officials don't. You know, I guess like public pushback, but, you know, that's that's their right. That's their opinion. I think an opinion is not wrong. It's it's their opinion. It's their belief. And there's certainly uh, and I encourage anybody to ever come out to a public hearing. I encourage anybody to write to their city council, provided it's done in a respectful manner. And it, I guess it's a case of listening to people. I think most people are reasonable and they realize that. Uh, you know, I guess they're not going to get everything in a wish list. One of the greatest things when I was campaigning, I, I offered rides to the polls, and I think I had four people take me up on it. And uh, a senior lady, she was great, and she says to me, um, you are totally out to lunch on the certain development. 
uh, which uh, which I was opposed to. And I'm thinking, oh, well, thanks for calling me for a ride to the polls. <laughs> and and what she said, it was, it was it was so refreshing. She said, but, you know, I'm voting for you because I like everything else about you and everything else you've said. And she read the questions in the various uh, media outlets where we have hundred words to answer. And she said, you know, I'm not going to like a hundred percent of something that everybody does. And even though she thought this one issue I was on the wrong side of, I thought, isn't that great? Because so many voters seem to be one issue voters. I think you have to look at the whole package. I want to, I want to talk about that for a second, because you mentioned something there that I find quite interesting. How do you balance what you believe is right against what you what your constituents want? Because I can imagine that's a hard part of the job because you can go into a meeting thinking, okay, this is how I'm going to vote because I've read what I've been given by administration. I think it's right. And then you go to that public hearing and you hear from the people and you go, well, this isn't a side that I wasn't thinking about, so I may have to flip my vote. When does that come into play for you or has it come into play in your time in office so far? Well, again, I think it's really, really important for an open mind and people will sometimes say, and, and the phone rings a lot. Our, our meetings are generally about like 1 till 8 p.m. with a break in between. And I get a lot of calls in the mornings of meetings and people say, well, how are you going on this or whatever? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, I've done my research and I guess watch the meeting and you'll find out because I, I think you really do have to. Uh, I mentioned Do you go into meetings open minded no matter what? Yeah, I really. Yeah, I think so. Maybe my maybe my critics might not necessarily agree, but I, I really do try and be as, you know, like that federal court judge. I try to be open and listen and assess and. We always do have the option of um, delaying something uh, two weeks if we have to. Uh, we've done that from time to time. But uh, as I said, uh, I, I definitely listen to the public and I, I do the research and vote my conscience. And I, I think it works most of the time. That's awesome. I want to turn to our last segment before we wrap up here, Counselor, and that is my favorite okay. segment, which is tourism. I love tourism. I, I love, love travel. Tourism. I love, I love co uh, commuting to different communities. I love seeing municipalities up close and personal. I have this weird fascination with city halls, so I love going to city halls to my husband's detriment. So if I was a tourist coming to your city tomorrow... What are the key things that I need to do for those people who are listening in Germany right now in Australia and are thinking, wow. okay, we're, we're coming to BC tomorrow. We're going to be coming to a Penticton area, the lower mainland area. Where should I be going in your city? Okay. Have you been to our city before, Chris? I have. I was waiting for that question, but yes, I yeah. have. In 20, oh, this is going to age me a bit. 2014, I did a big Chrysopalooza where I drove from Slave Lake to Calgary, Calgary, all the way to Vancouver, and I stopped in Penticton for about an hour. An hour? I wow. I was going to Vancouver. I had to continue oh, going. Okay, I had okay. a dog, so we had to stop for an hour, and we had to meet someone in Vancouver. So I apologize. Okay, I'm making well, an effort this summer to come back to your city, though. Okay, well, yeah, yeah I, I love it. Uh, it's like being on holidays uh, year-round. Okay, winter, we, we have a ski hill, uh, Apex Mountain. We A lot of the Olympic teams uh, do uh, train up at Apex. So that's pretty cool. It's beautiful year round. Uh, Penticton's one of two cities in the world that has a lake on each end, Okanagan Lake, and then um, about five kilometers up, uh, Skaha Lake. It's joined by a man made channel. Uh, people go on tubes and boats and rafts or whatever, and they they float down. That's quite a unique. That's quite a unique uh, travel feature that we have and uh wineries if you like the wine industry wine tasting uh we have all kinds of uh of tours and that sort of thing so you don't have to uh worry about impaired driving uh more recently we've got into craft brewery as we do a lot of other cities but we do have uh seven places all within walking distance um the natural beauty is phenomenal cycling uh we have an old abandoned air, uh rail line called the KBR Trail, which goes for miles and miles. And there's old trestles. 
and uh you can go up uh i have to use an e-bike because i'm not in good enough shape to go all the way out there but uh you can take a bike up cross a trestle uh be kind of at the side of a of a giant hill uh go up to an old abandoned railway tunnel uh what's family the events what's we the hidden a, gem What's the hidden gem that well, you're talking about things that people may know, but is there a spot like after a long council meeting or a long day at work that you just say, okay, I need to go decompress. Is it a park? Is it a restaurant? Is it like a little bookstore? What is that hidden gem? Oh, that wow. Oh, you thank, you. thank you. Um, <laughs> we have a Vancouver, Toronto caliber used bookstore <gasps> and it's really good. It's a used bookstore. It's, it's huge. The staff knows what they're talking about. I remember taking my uh, my dad there, and it's one and only visit to Penticton. And dad collects uh, Second World War books, and now a lot of them he already had. Dad never checks a book out of the library; he likes to, to buy it. But uh, he was impressed because not only did they have a large selection, but they had it divided so they'd have Churchill, War in the Pacific, the Americans. Uh, Canada's involvement and so they subdivided and he'd, he'd never seen such a thing so that's amazing that's right in our downtown uh and, and as I said crop breweries uh but what about we, yourself is there a spot that uh, you go to that you decompress or is it just home for you uh no no uh well I'm kind of a coffee shop guy and I, I never go to uh to a Horton's or a Starbucks or I try not to because I do like the independence and so um, a place called Bench Market, uh, Prague Cafe, uh, Buffalo Head Tapest Room at our, at our Lakeside Resort. Uh, if I guess I want something a little stronger than coffee, we do have a great craft brewery called uh, The Cannery, which is, which is awesome. Uh, our, our downtown is really neat. We have, a, we have a, an independent music store called The Groove Yard, which was, still is owned by two mayors ago. Um, and so because I do like uh, I do like vinyl albums and things like that um, I don't like to download and so just a lot of really kind of cool independent shops that a smaller place uh, will have to offer um, I want to end on this question because I know we've talked for about 40 minutes now and I oh, I said I love it yeah minutes. thank you um, I want to ask this last question and this is a open-ended question but what makes the city of Penticton is such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family. Hmm. I don't know. I just think overall we have great people. Uh, Mike Reno from Loverboy is from Penticton, so it doesn't get any better than that. For fans of the 80s, you know the guy with the headband? Uh, uh, he's one of our, our, our uh, most famous sons. Uh, Please tell you know, me you awesome have a big school. giant plaque on the entrance sign that says "Home of Mike Reno." No, I have. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I have thought for that. I don't know why they want because you know Mike has never done anything to embarrass the city of Penticton or himself. So I've always wanted them to do that. And I guess the argument is, well, there's people that do great things in the sciences and medicine and mathematics, and should you be honoring athletes or or rock stars? Uh, so I guess there's some, I guess there's some validity to that, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think we have awesome people. We've got a, a great school system, uh, a very welcoming community, as I said, a lot of, so what makes us different? Um, what made you want to go there? Just, what I, made you want to move there? Because you could have chosen anywhere when you moved and you chose. Well, where? actually, uh, actually, <laughs> actually, no, I was managing um, the twin dailies of Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, and I absolutely loved every second there. We had a great staff. It was a very, very large weekly at the time based on page count. Well, where I was working, I had an awesome parking spot, uh, best parking spot I've ever had in my career. And and I, I really liked it. I had tons of friends, unforgettable memories. And it was just a case of going from large daily to small, or big pardon, a large weekly to a small daily. I had really no idea what gem I was coming to because, in all honesty, they they did all the interviews over the phone, and probably because I love my job so much in in Spruce Stony that I didn't uh, research it as well as I could and. Uh, so, anyways, I loaded myself up and my dog and. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, drove the 12 hours and didn't get lost. Uh, this was the days before I had a GPS or anything. Everything went well. Traffic was fine. I'm looking and I'm coming, I guess, into Penticton from from Kelowna. I'm looking, oh my gosh, I've, you know, I've absolutely landed in paradise. Like this was just absolutely awesome. So why did I pick here? This is a beautiful place. The community has been extremely welcoming and uh, I guess you could say that about any community. People are great, great wherever you go, but it's just been, you know, it's like everywhere you look, it's postcard perfect. There's been a running joke in our, in our, uh, in, in the cross border interview staff, me and my husband, I should say. And every time we've spoken to a counselor in October of last year, they've all mentioned their amazing walking trails. You were the very first counselor, Mayor Reeve, to not mention walking trails. So thank you for making 2023 already off to a great start. And I don't have to hear about walking trails again. So thank you. No, we have bike lanes here, though. Oh, there you go. So, yeah. <laughs> There you go. Uh, yeah, um, oh, yeah. yeah we do have walk yeah, we have walking trails, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Miller, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a blast to get to know you. Well, thank you. Bit. I hope I did okay. And uh, thank you for asking the questions. And anybody's watching, come to Penticton. I'd love to see you. Hey, I, I'm coming to see a used bookstore because I'm a sucker for a good used book and a good old coffee. Oh, you'll so love it. Summer 2023, you and I will be grabbing a coffee at one of your local uh, coffee shops, okay? Okay. Thank you so much, Chris. So with that, I want to remind everyone, get off social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps Absolutely. us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.